Okay. Um, so my name is, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Quirin Pump. Uh, I work for ATIX and I am the principal maintainer of the Pulp Deb or Pulp Debian plugin. And uh, today I want to talk about community interactions and maintaining a plugin from outside the Cork Pulp team. So roughly one year ago, um, Pulp Deb went generally available with version 2.6.1. And I also held a talk at PulpCon 2020 on the state of the Pulp Debian plugin. And uh, I guess since then, it, okay, right, has been mostly bug fixing and stabilizing. So not that interesting to talk about the same thing again one year later. Hence, uh, I thought I'd focus more on the community interaction that have grown over the past year and my experience of yeah, maintaining this plugin uh, from outside the core pod team. Um, so since the first G generally available release one year ago, we've had 10 Y releases and 10 Z releases containing roughly five features and 10 bug fixes, which already gives you an indication of a relatively slow pace of development for this plugin. Uh, the reason being that it's mainly myself who's working on it part-time part -time next to my other, uh, next to the many other things I work at at ATEX. Yeah, uh, so very quickly, the biggest new feature we've had in the past year, which is slightly off topic for this talk, is the flat repo format sync, uh, which was introduced in 2.8, uh, but overhauled in 2.16, which is the most uh, recent release, uh, because it turned out it didn't actually work with many of the real world flat repos out there, and it's now much more robust. And I think that rehaul has also fixed some other bugs that weren't related to flat reposing. Okay. Um, the other thing I just wanted to um, talk about, yeah, is so you can already tell there were 10, 20 releases or something in the past year, but for only really 15 distinct changes, uh, which is a lot of releases. Uh, for not that many changes. And the reason for that is um, that, of course, the pulp core uh, release cycle. And that brings us right into our first topic uh, relating to plugin maintenance. Um, so the pulp core release cycle, which uh, there is a new Y release roughly every six weeks, is sort of the single biggest external con constraint on plugin maintenance because um, uh, every six weeks there may be new deprecations or breaking changes. And even if there aren't, at a minimum, I need to do a compatibility release uh, to declare compatibility against the new pulp core version, or at least against the next pulp core version up. Um, so these are two points I want to go into in more detail. The first point being the pulp core deprecation policy. And of course, this, so for, for anyone who doesn't know the pulp core deprecation policy, uh, whenever pulp core developers uh, do want to say, for example, drop something from the, or do a breaking change in the plugin API, for example, they will mark it as deprecated in the next Y release and only remove it or do the cha breaking change in the next Y release after that. So in principle for plugins, it should always be possible to declare compatibility against one additional pulp core version than the latest release. Um, of course, this affects all plugins, not just plugins maintained by me. <laughs> um, 
And uh, the second point I'd like to say is this uh, deprecation policy very much helps. I think without it would be anarchy and the Pulp Debian plugin would be broken every other Pulp Core Y release. Um, yeah, but even so, it, it, it means, of course, uh, a certain amount of set work every Pulp Core release cycle. And for that work, I've sort of collected by trial and error a heuristic of what I do as an independent plugin maintainer. So, which is release as soon as possible past a Pulp Core Y release, but of course only after I've gone through any announced deprecations and possibly fixed them if they affect me. Uh, but also don't be the first plugin to release post Pulp Core Y release because, um, well, the first plugin sometimes has early mover problems and I prefer if it's one of the plugins that uh, is maintained by the core team. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's just been sort of my personal experience. Yeah, and sort of from trial and error, I've given myself these two rules. And that brings me to my next point. So the visibility of deprecations is sort of the sooner the better. Um, because if, well, if I only see them in the sort of latest pulp core release notes, then between the, the time windows between that and release as soon as possible past that pulp core Y release is very small. And so in the best case scenario, somebody opens a Discord thread as soon as some core team member is, has started working on the change. And this sometimes happens and sometimes there's early discussion on breaking changes. And then there's the sort of lucky case where I, since I'm working on the plugin anyway, I can see warnings once they are the changes merged to pulp core main branch, but before it has been released. But that's dependent on my actually working against the latest pulp core main branch and running tests there. Uh, yeah. Um, and sort of the worst case is well, I only see it once in the pulp core Y release notes, and that's a worst case because, as I said, that's a very small window between that and release as soon as possible past the pulp core Y release. Uh, and of course, there's a worst worst case where the breaking change was not anticipated. I think that happens, but in those cases, it affects everyone equally and maybe the changes rolled back. So it's not something that hits me worse than anybody else. And then sometimes there's an odd case where a breaking change cannot follow the deprecation policy for reasons. I think we might have had that with the Django updates at some point. I don't remember exactly right now. Uh, but also in that case, it's something that affects everyone equally. And there's usually plenty of announcements and discussions and how are we going to do it and help to be gotten. Right. Then the other thing I wanted to talk about was the plugin release process. Um, so in some sense, from my point of view as an independent plugin maintainer, it's just work that needs doing every six weeks, um, releasing the plugin either, well, because there has been a new pulp core version and either to fix deprecations or uh, just to declare compatibility against the next pulp core version. And then of course, I also need to do it whenever there's some concrete need or when I want to release something because I want that feature out or I want to release a bug fix. But then in those cases, I don't mind because of course I immediately myself derive the benefit that I hope to achieve with this action. Um, so the plugin release process is just recurring work. Um, it has become a lot easier with increased automation. I guess to some extent it has been recurring work for everyone, including all the core team members who also maintain plugins, uh, which is, I guess, one of the reasons why there has been this investment in increased automation. 
Nevertheless, it still requires some manual steps and also sort of waiting for pipelines between manual steps, which I'm not terribly effective at then using this time effectively, um, which, yeah, is perhaps my fault, but also perhaps unfortunate. And of course, so the solution there would be further automation. And I suggest uh, if we have time at the end of the talk, we could have a look at the release guide article in the wiki and go through those steps because I think it's actually fairly clear which ones can be further automated and which ones not. Okay, but now I spent a lot of time talking about um, the Pub Debian plugin and release processes and release cycles and technical things. And actually the title of my talk was Community Interactions. So let's talk about community interactions. Um, well, where do these community interactions happen? On the various communication channels. And uh, well, there's first of all, matrix and IRC. Uh, maybe I just go over and have a look at them. So I am pretty much permanently logged into element here and have all the different pulp channels. And apparently I've been pinged, but I'm not gonna look at that right now. And of course, matrix is great for myself because uh, for everything that is sort of quick communication or if I have a quick question right away. Uh, then there's the mailing lists, which are sort of waning in relevance uh, because things are moving to discourse instead. And I guess discourse complements matrix since it's similar, but with more extended discussion possible and with more of a memory for later for yeah, things that need that. Um, and all of these things, so mailing this matrix discourse um, or its previous incarnations, I guess, for discourse um, have been around since, or have been my primary sources of communication with the core pulp team for as long as I can remember. Um, in the past year, what has really been added and which has been sort of the cherry on top for me is regular meetings. And uh, so the one meeting is the Pulp Core Cotello Pulp Dep Integration Meeting, which de facto right now is a meeting between ATIX people uh, from the Pulp Dep side and um, Grant from Pulp and Justin from Cotello. And this has, we, we've done it roughly once a month and it has been just really great to get that additional sort of personal face-to-face -face time collecting all my questions that I have on the site that I can't easily answer and then just discussing them out or going over them once a month. And I feel, yeah, so, this is a great example of how helpful the core pub team is and how willing they are to open these channels of communication with an independent plugin maintainer like myself. And um, I think feel has really deepened the communication and exchange over the past year. And then sort of since I discovered how useful that meeting has been for me, I have also then discovered open floor uh, since the difference here is that open floor, I guess, is really just for pulp and not for sort of the intersection of pulp Cartello and pulp Debian. Um, and so I have increasingly put things on the agenda for open floor during the week and then showed up. And that's great whenever, I don't know, I have some question kicking around my head that isn't sort of doesn't find any immediate responses on matrix or discourse. And uh, at that point in time, if I put it on the open floor agenda, everybody's sort of there and has already set apart that time and we'll go over the topic then. Finally, there's tickets and PRs, which are also a form of communication. Uh, so sometimes, uh, I don't know, if I don't have time to fix something I see on some pulp core, 
thing, I will just open a ticket and that way it's not totally forgotten. Um, and the final thing, I guess, is the plugin tape template GitHub repo, which I watch because, well, that's kind of the thing that keeps all the different plugins in sync. And so as a independent plugin maintainer, that gives me a lot of information what's happening and yeah, what I need to pay attention to. Right. Um, so all of this has worked very well. And I think there has been a lot of sort of deepening interaction through all of these channels between myself and the community. And I recommend for any potential plugin authors out there to actively participate in all of these various channels. Um, nevertheless, there are some challenges that remain, of course. Uh, so the thing that I would like to sort of, where I would like to improve interaction further and where I would like to deepen communication further is sort of keeping similar pulp depth features in sync with other plugins that are maintained by the core team. Um, and so the best example of that, I guess, is metadata mirroring for pulp uh, within pulp RPM, which is very similar feature to the uh, verbatim publisher that we've had in pulp depth for a long time, but a completely different implementation. And uh, it's, I mean, I guess there have been some challenges around metadata mirroring on the pulp RPM side and sort of mirror image uh, challenges on the pulp depth side because, yeah, the implementation is different. Um, other examples are advanced copy API and maybe also like the auto publish feature. So these are features that we would like to have in pulp Debian but, and already exist for Pulp RPM and other plugins. Uh, and of course, so when we do get around to them, it would be great to implement them in a similar way and not reinvent the wheel. Um, so that is something that I may yeah, actively pursue going forward to find more of an entry point for myself into understanding Pulp RPM and then mirroring it in Pulp Debian. Right, external contributors. Um, so it turns out the tables have turned. Uh, I ha now have an external contribution for the Pulp Debian plugin and here by I external, I mean external to myself <laughs> and the Pulp core team. Uh, so maybe we just have a quick look at that. This is, of course, something I'm happy about. Uh, and it's also a quite cool and very large feature. So initial source file and source indices support, so yeah, which we currently don't have in the Pulp Debian plugin. And uh, so now I get to experience things from the other direction um, where the challenge is finding time to review this rather large change. And uh, it, there's a sort of familiar pattern of um, either I don't have time or the contributor doesn't have time and it takes a while to continue on. Also, it's a large change and it can only really be considered complete if there are tests for it, which there currently aren't. Um, which is a challenge because uh, working on the test suite isn't my favorite part of the pulp ecosystem to work on. And uh, I think it's also very difficult or any external contributor is gonna need some help with the fixtures and writing tests because it's not the easiest part to work on. Um, so yeah, that's the name of the contribution and here's the contributor. So I'm hoping there will soon be further progress with that. Um, now I'm already getting to sort of the lessons to draw from what I've been talking about. So uh, lessons for the core pulp team, or I guess my wish list. <laughs> 
for you guys. Um, so as an independent plugin maintainer, I really appreciate uh, any and all additional release process automation. Um, communicating deprecations and breaking changes as soon as possible. And I think preferably on this course. Um, on a side note, I guess it's been said in, in other sessions at PulpCon this year, uh, I feel like it's worth going ahead and completing the move from mailing list to this course. Uh, right now, sort of both places are sort of half alive and half dead, which is not optimal. Um, yes, I really appreciate active help with fixing deprecations in my plugin when I don't have a deep understanding of the relevant pulp core change, which I've generally gotten when there was, when it was more than, you know, this function is no longer in use, use this function instead. Uh, you know. And I really appreciate all the open and responsive communication channels. Um, yeah, I've gone over those. Uh, then there's lessons for potential plugin authors. So as an independent plugin maintainer slash author, you should make sure you have access to all these available communication channels. Everyone will be happy to help in my experience and donate a lot of time and energy. And uh, I guess it just requires setting up once and then you can always have them running on the side. Um, be aware of the pulp core release cycle, the deprecation policy and the plugin release process. I've gone over those things a bit. Um, I've also within the pulp Debian documentation, uh, if I can find it, I have here a section on plugin maintenance, which is basically notes by myself for myself. <laughs> Um, but might be of interest to any other potential plugin authors out there. Um, right. Expect regular maintenance work within every six week pulp core release cycle. So I suppose one could, depending on the plugin, uh, target only every second pulp core release or something, but that would have other disadvantages. So that's just to say there is a certain ground level of maintenance work that needs to be done to keep the just to keep the plugin running, even if it doesn't need new features or changes. Um, and well, you should be aware of that or plan for it or you know. And I recommend understanding the plugin template and monitoring the GitHub repo. And um, I guess if one is a independent plugin author, one will very soon get to interact with the plugin template anyway. It's probably the first thing one will be directed towards. Um, so that kind of is a given anyway. Yeah, then uh, I do want to give a small pulp dep related goals for the coming year and outlook. Uh, so, like I've said, I'd like to improve parallelity with Pulp RPM on some features there. Uh, and I may try to reach out to the folks working on Pulp RPM for that. Um, I really want to free up the time for reviewing and merging that external source package contribution. Um, I hope I will get around to it soon. Well, I mean, it's been going back and forth. It's not like I haven't been doing anything, but right now I think the ball is with me again. Um, yeah. Internally, we are now, so at ATIX, we are now quite far along with integrating pub 3 based Catello into our, our Carino. The reason that's significant is because it means we're now doing very large scale integration tests, uh, which of course are going to catch things that the plugin test suite just can't change. Um, and we obviously will only 
release it to our customers once we are very confident in those integration tests that we've done. And then once we do release it to customers, it will get even more real world fire experience, um, coverage, edge cases. So when that happens, I will, or I plan to sort of, uh, well, are getting ahead of myself. Um, the other thing that means is once we do release to customers for our development efforts, we'll enter a new phase uh, back towards uh, additional features and nice to have things and away from just getting things stable and working. And so when that does happen, I plan to bump the major version of the plugin to announce that yeah, change in project phase, I suppose. And there's Pulpkey, Gabion, and Squeezer modules, which we really have on our wish list, but never get around to actually doing. And uh, then all the nice to have feature work that will happen hopefully someday. So we'll see us again in one year and uh, maybe still not have done them. And that's mainly what I've got for my talk. So I do hope we can do some discussion and questions. Um, and yeah, and I put my contact up there one more time in case people still want to get in touch later. Yeah. Any questions so far? I suppose, Corinne, um, if I would just start with that, um, that open floor meeting, um, how, why was it, how will I phrase this? How did it come onto your radar that that would be useful for you? I, I'm aware, I feel that we have that, we run that all the time. I was like tweeting for ages about it, but I didn't really get anywhere doing that, if I'm honest, it wasn't the right place. But how did you start to see the the value in it? Um, uh, well, to me, it well, I guess we started that other regular meeting um, because it just turned out that there were sort of regular issues coming up that needed sort of face-to-face -face discussion relating to that very particular thing of the intersection of Catello, Pulp Debian, and Pulp Core, I guess. And uh, I guess Grant and Justin were kind enough to donate their time for that and just make it a regular thing. And because through the experience of having that meeting, uh, I sometimes sort of um, put things on the agenda for that meeting that I then sort of notice actually only relate to Pulp and not to Catello. And then decided, well, I know that the open floor meeting exists. I did have this in the back of my head somewhere. I just never used it. Um, and so through that experience, I got the idea, well, I might use it in much the same way and actually put things on the open floor agenda when I have those kinds of questions. Thank you. Uh, uh... I don't know if that helps you in terms of <laughs> advertising <laughs> open floor. No, I just, I just genuinely wanted to know what was the progression to realizing that's a useful activity um because uh, yeah I, that's but that answers it thank you yeah i don't know should i call on people who've raised their hands or how does it work <laughs> I, i'm just trying to figure out where i get this cue uh, it's gone from me you have to look at the uh, uh participant list mel it's at the top of the participant list okay thank you it was there before and um, so um matthias i believe you have a, a question uh, thank you for the talk very interesting um and I'm, I'm glad that you feel our release automation is coming along uh about that it's more like a statement than a question and maybe something for a talk tomorrow um I think we need a better way to make the deprecation warnings visible in CI. Because my experience is that, we, that they are just buried somewhere. They 
we, we introduce them properly, but they never surface and no one ever realizes there's something to do before he starts a release. And sometimes even the release is out and the deprecations are still in there. And yeah, that's I... just not what the deprecation policy is meant to do. And yeah. There's one other thing. Um, you said the deprecation policy helps here in developing. So my question is, would it be a big benefit to extend it to two releases? Well, it would increase the time window. And so like, yeah, so one of the challenges for me as an external plugin maintainer is that, uh, well, I guess we're all resource constrained. I think a lot of the challenges are sort of the same challenges as for the pulp core team members who maintain plugins and release plugins and so on. Just, um, I guess, I have other, like, it's very part, much part time for me because I have other you know, commitments within ATIX that I devote my time to, and which means. It's very, you know, it very quickly happens. You get like a week of vacation, uh, something else comes up. And uh, so then, you know, three weeks are over without having looked at pulp twice. Um, and so when a new pulp core version comes along, it's just diff the difficulty for me is sort of planning because it comes from externally i have no control over it the pulp core release is announced yes but it just comes along and then i have to react and if the window to react is very small then of course that puts me under how does one say zugzwang, a certain amount of yeah uh when every six weeks which is just not a very nice experience and uh, so in that case it would help if the window were larger on the other hand, then there's a risk maybe of people sort of forgetting about what that change was about and then scrambling six weeks later or 12 weeks later, if it's two release cycles and trying to figure out what needed fixing. So I didn't, hmm. <laughs> I, I think the, the, my, my biggest sort of um, uh, plea is when you start working on some change and it looks like there's going to be a deprecation involved, open a discourse thread right then and there, because that's earlier than it getting merged and earlier than it getting released. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me just say, without the deprecation policy, the window is actually negative. Yes. Because <laughs> and then you need to act on it already too late. And on the other hand, I, I don't really think that it would help you making less releases, you would simply, or you would still do a release for every pub core release, I believe. So maybe it's not even less work to do, just more time for it. And I want to say, sometimes when you introduce a new feature, you need to remove something. And if that something now needs three releases to be removed, then the new feature has to wait. And so that's yeah, okay. maybe a reason not to increase this. Uh, application policy cycle. I, I don't have my hand raised, but what you said, Matthias, is exactly the point that I ended up with as well. Um, the only real win that I can think of is decreasing the amount of work. Because if we spread the same amount of work over more time, um, what we're really doing is trading intensity of work for slowness. And so that's why I mean, really, the trick, I think, has to be how to do less work. And there's some, I have some other ideas on that, too, but I, I don't want to take away from, um, I don't want to get into that right now, exactly. But we should do something. And thank you for the great talk, Kieran. I was going to suggest just releasing even more frequently. <laughs> yeah, that because that way Kieran can make this his full-time job, and then you know, have a problem. Grant. Oh, I guess I am up next. Um, so I'm actually going to add a question in front of the one I, I was planning to ask. In this context of um, deprecation policy and releases, I heard two things, two 
qualitatively different things. One is reacting to deprecations. And the, regardless of what our what our policy is, the only thing that really helps there, Karen, is as soon as we know there's a deprecation, making it as public as possible so that you hear it and can plan, whether that's you have to do it in six weeks or 12, you, uh, knowing early is the best possible thing there. But the other thing I heard is regardless of what the deprecation policy is, you know, because we all want to, I've released um, a plugin that's good for pulp core N and N plus one. And mm -hmm. even if we made that N plus two, it still means every release or every other release of pulp core, I need, I want to release my plugin to make sure that it is available for use by the, the next, um, the next Y release of pulp core. And if there's nothing to do in your plugin, every minute you spend on that feels like like uh, make work to some degree, if I can put words in your mouth. Um, so any automation we can do to go back to one of your first bullet points, any automation we can do to make it possible for a plugin author to say, I'm not actually changing anything except the upper bounds for pulp core. If that could be something that you could push a button and just have it happen and it would do all the right plugin template work and edit all the right files and just do a release with the next version that says i'm now accessible to pulp core n plus four when it used to be n plus three would take a big load off of the the steady state if you will when i because so the deprecations have is their own thing you have to do work there there's just no way to get around it but it's the it's the i don't have any work to do here but i just want to be you know, Compatible, appropriate yeah. for the next one. Exactly right. The more automatic we can make that, the easier your job gets. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, certainly true. So I think, um, and sort of just high level logically, right, it seems like there's no reason it shouldn't be possible to push a button, supply it with like two parameters or something, yeah. and, and then the plugin is released automatically. with compatibility plus one yeah i mean assuming um, i mean douglas yeah, has a great douglas has a great comment here in chat i don't know if anybody's seen that which is essentially automatic qualification if the ci passes have it just happen that which i don't know what what all that would take but that would be very cool essentially hand this over to the robot of ci where ci says well there's a you know there's been a new release of pulp core this plugin passes i'm just going to automatically bump it and, and that would take a while before I'd trust that, but it would be really cool if we could get there. I guess that feeds into Matthias's point that the uh, deprecation warnings aren't handled by the CI. Yeah, so like that would be a prerequisite for that. Exactly. So, right. the, I mean, I guess when we do a release, at some point the tests are run anyway. I'm not sure exactly at what point. Uh, so the deprecation warnings are flying out of that. So I guess the CI could analyze that and decide if the plugin is ready for compatibility plus one or not. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think that's correct. Oh. Okay, cool. It I feels... definitely want to see, yeah, us handling the deprecation warnings. Yeah, make it a little and having louder. having an analysis of that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I have another idea about this deprecation policy, but I'm hesitant to share it because I want to make sure that we're using our time to ask Kieran about his external experience. Um, so Brian, if you'll let me, I'll, I'm going to ask one more question. I'll tell you what, you raise your hand, we'll get through whatever other questions there are, and then we can come back to the deprecation policy. How about that? Um, that sounds good. I do not have my hand raised. Go for it. OK. Um, so Kieran, the, the, the thing that occurred to me is you're talking about, you know, Ocarina is going to be released with Pulp 3 support. So now, speaking as a as a core team member, that's that's a new downstream product that is going to, as you point out, have a bunch of users that are going to make Pulp Three do things that it should never legally be allowed to do, and yet here we are. Um, our other downstream products have their own their own reporting structure. Um, you know, a lot of Bugzilla gets used, and they integrate um, with the upstream issue tracker. Like uh, when satellite, when a satellite customer runs into a problem that's pulp related, there's a bugzilla and a whole bunch of downstream reporting that happens. But there's also a link to 
the upstream uh, right now, the red mine issue, where we're going to be working on that so that everybody knows what's going on and who's working on it and what state it's in. There's a lot of automation that happens. Do you do anything like that for your product where you can, because your customers don't want to go to our red mine to open it because they don't know yeah. it's pulp. They just know it's Ocarina. So do you have something like that where you can link your tracking systems to point into the the pulp tracking system to make sure that everybody knows what state fixes you're in uh i guess it's um well yes our customers open tickets with our support yeah um they're not gonna go anywhere else um i guess right now it's mostly manual so if we decide it's a pulp issue then one of us will open a pulp issue on the upstream pulp tracker do you link do you link your back to your or do you link uh, your ticketing I think system our ticketing system is not public so no <laughs> okay um i guess we will on our ticket link to the upstream thing we opened and revisit and try to see whether there's a reaction or actively look for one um but yeah, I don't know if that can be improved. I, it's uh, the thought that hasn't occurred to me. I haven't put much thought into it. So okay. <laughs> uh, okay. it's an interesting suggestion, but I probably need some time to think about it. Okay. Um, one more observation I've sort of remembered um, uh, that I didn't mention during my talk. What's not very transparent to me sometimes is, or, I got the feeling again from trial and error, when there's a pulp core Y release, sometimes the other plugins maintained by you guys um, sort of release very soon after that pulp core Y release. And sometimes they appear to release towards the end of the next pulp core release cycle, which is to me just random. I have no like, insight yeah. into why that might be or or what's going on there you're and not so, wrong <laughs> so, so 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 that's where i guess the, i developed this heuristic of i don't want to be the first plugin to release because if all the upstream plugins are waiting a long time there's probably a reason for it i i just don't know that reason <laughs> yeah the reason is that there are other priorities <laughs> i think people <laughs> just kind of let it go by the wayside and I kind of think the reason is because it happens every other one and that there's a subtle pattern to it. Because what happens is we have to release the single container and then it's like, oh, everybody released their plugins right before the release. And then Pulp Core comes out and no one has to take really any action because they've already released a plugin that's plus one compatible. And then time passes and time passes. And then uh, at some point it just comes out again. But it's just a theory. Catch up. And also, I think it, it interacts oddly, Brian, which is why the pattern isn't as obvious as, as it might be. It interacts oddly with, but this Y release of Pulp Core has a deprecation. And so even if we're mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the low point, some plugins are might be like, I need to address that deprecation right now because it's important to me. And so you'll see a certain amount of interaction there. So it's like biorhythms, right? You've got two waves going. One is the one that Brian notes which is I'm good for two releases, so I don't have to be in a hurry to get out for this next Pulp Core release, interacting with the, oh, these deprecations affect me and I really want to get that out early, um, which is why the pattern is really hard to spot, to spot, I think. But a lot of it really is, as Dennis pointed out, is it's just, it's priorities and resources and time. And if I'm not going to break one container by not doing a release right this second, then it'll get done next week or the week after instead of Monday kind of thing. And sometimes it's also just um, when features are hitting the plugins, because if there haven't really been any features since the last Y release, there's really no, and it's compatible, there's really no point in doing a new Y release. But then you know maybe in three weeks there'll be a couple more features, and now we can you know push a new Y release, and maybe it's now towards the end of the pull course cycle. Yep, that's true. That's a whole that's a whole other um, sine wave, Daniel. That's a good point. Um, before I give up the the mic here, I just want to go back to the 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 downstream reports discussion just to put this kind kind of a bug in your head, Kieran. A lot of times, once real users out in the real world start hammering on things, they uncover stuff, and the only way for us to figure out what's going on 
is to be is to get more information from the person that's having the failure and the ocarina use is the first instance i think for us where that's going to be happening to people that do not have any relationship you know any contractual relationship with red hat as an organization and we're not allowed to see anything about them so one of the things that we need to think about we everyone in this meeting honestly working working with atix is how can we fix those bugs when we absolutely do not have access to the customer's machines <laughs> and that'll be something that that's going to be i think a challenge once you go once you go live um i don't have an answer to it but it, i think it's something we're going to need to be intentional about or as you as you go live with your with your product that uses pulp 3. i mean i will i will bring this up internally like i said it's sort of i've not it's not cropped up in my background thinking, but it's a good point, I'm sure. And I will bring it up internally and see what people say. Cool. Um, we have a one, raised hand, right? Um, just quickly on that one particular topic, you might consider um, the value of prioritizing the pulp depth CLI, because um, what I found is that for Catello, for example, when we they're like, oh, there's a problem. We're like, OK, what's your reproducer? Here's 50 API call commands, of which many could go wrong. Um, or here's like two CLI commands. And so having the avail availability of that tool, I think would allow the core team to um, run your Debian workload a lot easier. So perhaps along with that internal conversation, which I know is hard, very hard I, to find the time to do. I, I think um, there is a great uh, desire in ATIX to have the CLI for our customers, but uh, yeah, it's just finding the time as always. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a great uh, uh, desire to get everything else done. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, Karen, I have a question for you about, you mentioned some future plans. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is about the PAL 2 to 3 migration. Mm -hmm. um, because currently there is a PR open from edX which adding certain like a small feature to it. Uh, so my question is, when do you think you will like you plan to stop or at least adding features? So we can well, open um, a question uh, for you now within us like to, and consider stopping support for the migration like in at certain. Okay. Point. I think I think I can answer that. So the the reason I think that has opened up now that pull request I think by Marcos is because we are now doing those back to back integration tests where we're using the two to three migration and then uh, in on our Catello branch and then uh, upgrading to the next Catello version and until we've sort of uh, hopefully have a smooth transition for our customers on our weird Ocarino build from one version to the next. And so we discover some small things there. I mean, it's not critical for us that these pull requests are merged since we could, by now we have our own internal build where we build our own branch and can just use that and just, yeah. Um, uh i think right now we're still discovering some new bugs that we haven't discovered frequently because we're doing those integration tests right now pretty much <laughs> um so there will also be i think i i'm pretty sure i need to do at least one bug fix pr soon where um one of the debian content types needs to use a smaller uh, what was it batch size than all the other content types for complex, complicated reasons. Uh, and of course, we've only discovered that now where we actually run migrations at scale where the batch size actually matters. Because so far, it's always been sort of, oh, I've synced a couple of repositories and the migration worked fine because I've never actually been anywhere near that batch size. <laughs> um, OK, yeah. thank you, Kieran. That, uh, that helps and answers my question. Thank you. 
Any final questions, comments for Quirin? Okay, Doug, thank you very much, Quirin. This is very informative. I am going to stop the recording and we can have a break before the next session. Thanks a lot.